Devil's Backbone. Let's take a look at this bizarre event, tonight, on Project Algerine. Not all monsters are written about in books. Sometimes they hide among us and are only written about in old newspapers. Take for example, this story, dating back over 120 years. A story with a different kind of monster. This monster is about evil and the evil that men can do. This is a chronicle of how that evil managed to manifest itself into some of the most sacred places in our community. Sometimes, history is like a puzzle, where new pieces may come together, over time. Each one of those pieces becomes part of Eerie's folklore, which weaves itself into the community, and over time, usually develop into urban legends. Tonight, we will attempt to put a few of those pieces, together. Again, you won't see this story in your local history books. In fact, there is some evidence that shows, some of the events were intentionally not reported to authorities at that time. This is, the long dark journey of George Lockman, and his group of marauders, who brutally robbed and terrorized several local churches and clergymen, around the turn of the last century. Join us, as we explore, Devil's Backbone. Our story begins in Cleveland, Ohio, way back in 1899. Small-time criminal George Lockman and two other men, known as Cracker Murphy and Rochester Jim, somehow come across a copy of an eerie newspaper. In this newspaper, Lockman notices an advertisement for a brewery in Erie, which appears to be thriving. The three men have decided to rob the Cascade Brewing Company. The men discuss the details of their plan on the way into town. They stash their horses in a nearby ravine and begin to make their way up Delaware Avenue. Suddenly, a local man exited the small church on the corner and was immediately confronted by Rochester Jim. Fearing the man would alert the authorities, he's forced to accompany them to the brewery. Once inside the brewery, they find a single man working on the second floor. He is immediately subdued by the men. Murphy locates the safe and blows off the door. The men cleared out the cash and vanished into the night. Both of the victims were left tied up on different floors of the brewery. One of the men eventually freed himself and was able to go for help. This was just the beginning of Lockman's reign of terror. Once the men made it back to Cleveland and began to split up their loot, Lockman realizes that the money and jewelry they took from the man leaving the church was significantly more than they got from the brewery job. He immediately hatches a plan to target the churches in Erie. Lockman and his men quickly saddle their horses and begin to head east. The first church they selected for their insidious agenda was located on West 21st and Sassafras Street. The men were very methodical and quiet. The crime went almost completely undetected until the following day. The men soon discovered that from time to time, many of the clergy would tend to have wealthy guests staying in their homes. The guests quickly became ripe targets for the gang, and the robberies became more brazen as time went on. That is, until Lockman gets his hands on some clergy attire and takes things to an entirely new low. 
it's reported that he begins to rob people inside of the churches while dressed as a nun. It's believed he enjoyed this part because he could just sit and wait and let the people come to him instead of the other way around. The robberies became more and more violent as time went on. Sometimes happening in broad daylight. On the evening of May 19, 1901, Lockman and his gang of thieves pull off the robbery of Father Decker's home located on Wallace Street. That evening, while Father Decker, the house mother, and a visiting guest all slept, Lockman and the men descend on the building. After entering the house on the second floor and waking the house mother in the process, the men scurry to gather the rest of the occupants of the home. First, they wake up a house guest named Gretchen and escorted her to the living room. By this time, Father Decker wakes up due to hearing the commotion caused by the frightened house mother. He's forced into the living room where he is joined by the others, who have by now been bound and gagged. Father Decker is then forced at gunpoint to open the safe. The men reportedly made off with a little bit of cash, gold, and possibly a rare stamp collection. When they were finished, the men suddenly disappeared off into the night, much like phantoms, never to be seen again, or so they thought. Just ten days later, while walking on State Street, Father Decker just happens to come face to face with two of the men who robbed him that night. The priest runs to the nearby police station for help, only to find it empty. When the police finally did respond, they were incorrectly dispatched to Father Decker's home on Wallace Street, instead of the marketplace on State Street, where they had been seen. On May 31, 1901, in the small borough of Girard, which is located a few miles west of Erie, the police foil a plan to sell some of the stolen items. At approximately 11 p.m. that night, Lockman was captured, he had been hiding in a nearby field. The terror, known as George Lockman, has come to an end. But that's not the end to the story. Lockman's luck had finally run out. He'd been captured and was transferred to the jail in Erie. Upon arriving in Erie, he began to snitch on the rest of the gang. Lockman shared his cell with a small child, who had been locked up for a petty crime. He bragged about how his gang stole guns from Flickinger's store and then took clothes from Wolf and Weinstock that was located on Parade Street. Lockman also confessed to killing a man in Ohio during a robbery of an illegally operating gambling facility. His plans to escape his jail cell in Erie were thwarted when the little boy told the police about Lockman's escape plan in exchange for his release. At the trial, things got pretty heated at times. Lockman acted as his own defense counsel. The community was rightfully angry at this man and wanted the prosecutor to throw the book at him. This is where Lockman's records become a bit fuzzy. It's believed that he died in a Kentucky prison sometime around 1936. The police were unable to recover many of the stolen items. A rare book of stamps couldn't be fenced locally and was most likely stashed. When the child was questioned whether or not Lockman had told him where they hid their stolen loot. The child told authorities that Lockman mentioned it was near a small ravine or hillside where they would hide their horses when in town. He said the gang called the location Devil's Backbone. You've been watching Devil's Backbone on Project Algerine.